Trump stayed with history. That's for hardball. Good evening, I'm Chris Matthews in Washington. Trump has brought us to this. Tonight he stands at the edge of a dreaded destiny, about to become only the third American president to be impeached by the U.S. House of Representatives. This Wednesday, the House is set to debate and vote on two articles of impeachment against the president, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. Early this morning, House Judiciary Committee Democrats formally presented their final case against the president, releasing their impeachment report, arguing that President Trump has, quote, betrayed the nation by abusing his high office to enlist a foreign power in corrupting democratic elections. Well, the House is all but certain to approve those two articles, paving the way for a trial next month in the U.S. Senate. Senate Minority Leader, Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer has delivered the Democrats opening salvo on how that trial should be conducted. Should. In a letter to Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Schumer said, Senate Democrats believe strongly, and I trust Senate Republicans agree, that this trial must be one that is fair, that considers all the relevant facts, and that exercises the Senate's sole power of impeachment under the Constitution with integrity and dignity. Schumer argued that the Senate should subpoena testimony from former National Security Advisor John Bolton, acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, as well as Robert Blair, a senior advisor to Mulvaney, and Michael Duffy, an official in the Office of Management and Budget. Well, speaking today, Schumer argued that those four men had the most direct contact with the facts regarding the president's efforts to pressure Ukraine to pursue his own political investigations. I haven't seen a single good argument about why these witnesses shouldn't testify or these documents be produced unless the president has something to hide and his supporters want that information hidden. The president and House Republicans have resisted letting all the evidence and facts come out. The president hasn't offered a single exculpatory bit of evidence that refutes what's in the House impeachment charges. They have not refuted them. Well, impeachment moves forward again tomorrow in the House as the Rules Committee of the House needs to set the parameters for the debate process ahead of Wednesday's historic vote. For more, I'm joined by Congresswoman Pramila Jayapur of Washington State, I think Seattle, who serves on the House Judiciary Committee. Paul Re Rosenzweig, who served as senior counsel in the investigation of President Clinton. And Heidi Presley, who's been everywhere the last couple of weeks, but in NBC news cars. So every time I turn the TV on NBC, you're on, Heidi. Thank you. Let's start with the congresswoman about the report. Uh, what is the strongest language in the report as you see it and you've read it and you've reported it? I have, yeah, over 600 pages. And I would say the strongest language is that these two constitutional crimes of abuse of power and obstruction of Congress are the highest constitutional crimes that any president can commit and that they absolutely destroy um, any sense of democracy because remember this is uh, the democracy depends on the power of the people giving all of our votes to a president that's where the power derives from not from the bloodlines of monarchs but from the votes of people so if a president is asking for a foreign country to interfere in our elections he is essentially destroying that democracy. Now add to that that he has put himself above the law. He, he, he and his team say that they cannot be indicted. He cannot be indicted while he's a sitting president. Now they're saying that they don't have to provide information to Congress so that we can actually investigate this. So I think that is really the strongest case. And there are lots of ways to describe that. But at the core of it, he is destroying our democracy and taking votes okay. away from you and me and giving it to a Here's your chance, Congresswoman, to say what you think of Trump. Because I know you've all been constrained by party unity to agree on two articles. And great. But throughout the language of both articles is the language about pattern. Yes. Who is this person? Is this the person who would do something like the deal on the phone? 
right. who had set up that kind of deal, put Giuliani out there to do it, follow up, hold up arms aid necessary to save a country. Who is that person that you're that you're impeaching here this week? Yeah. Who is he? Well, pattern of conduct is in both of the articles because <clears throat> it is bad enough that the president is doing this and it's unfolding in front of us with Ukraine as the president of the United States. But we know that he did this before. That's what the Mueller report was about. 400 pages saying that this is exactly what he did this before. This is who he is. Everybody heard him, Chris. I want you, you know, to tell me who he is. He, who is he, this president, this is, human he being? He is a guy who believes he is above the law, that he is not accountable to the American people, that he does not have to uh, represent the interests of this nation. He is the smoking gun. Anybody who is looking for a smoking gun just needs to look at this president. And let me tell you something. Not only is he the smoking gun, He's done it before, he's doing it now, he's gonna do it again. That smoking gun is reloaded, and whether or not it fires for the 2020 election is up to us if we actually are able to hold him accountable. You know, we see this in life, you know, a guy can get into sports and a college and still be from, he hasn't changed, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, people don't change. In fact, I always ask people, you know anybody's ever changed? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a brutal question, yeah. especially married people, because most people stay who they are all their lives. And Trump, who is this guy that I know from reading about it, you think deserves to be impeached? What is it about him essentially? Not what happened on a July day in a phone call, but what that represents about his being, this guy Trump, and why he shouldn't be president. Well, your, your well, lights. I mean, on the, on the narrow questions, I agree completely with the congresswoman that, that you know, he's destructive of democracy and his resistance to congressional subpoenas is essentially a, a, a thumb in the, in the face of checks and balances. But I think more fundamentally, uh, Donald Trump is about the destruction of the norms of, of the American Republic that go back to the founding. Free press, free and independent press is now enemy of the people. Uh, president not subject to subpoena. That's why we had a revolution against a king, right? You could go on and on. Not, uh, president not taking uh, money for his own personal benefit out of his presidency. That's the emoluments clause. There's suits going on about that. It, it reflects in the long run is he a, a fundamental? Crook? Is he a crook? Oh, absolutely. I signed a letter with a thousand other prosecutors saying that the Mueller report had uh, th anywhere between three and eight, depending upon your view of it, instances of obstruction of justice that most of us would have taken to any jury in America and won a conviction on were he anybody other than the president of the United States. Well, meanwhile, there's a behind it. I wanted to get to this because I think years from now, if we're all still around, we'll all be trying to explain this to somebody. Maybe our grandkids. I'm on the way to doing that now. I got them. Why this? You can't just say it's a phone call. You can't just say with Nixon it was a break-in. There's it's, it's something about the character of the person that's being targeted here by reasonable people. Anyway, meanwhile, there's a behind-the-scenes effort by some House Democrats to bolster their argument in a Senate trial with the help of a former Republican. The Washington Post first reported that some House Democrats are pushing to include Michigan Congressman Justin Amash, who left the Republican Party over his support for impeachment as one of the impeachment managers when they get to the Senate next month. The campaign's being pushed by 30 freshmen in the House. That means new members of the House. The thinking is that Amash would reach conservative voters in a way Democrats can't. He also would provide Democrats cover from GOP accusations that they're pursuing a partisan impeachment. Heidi, how far is this going as you see it? As of this morning, my sources close to leadership poured cold water on this, Chris. They said that the speaker has plenty of qualified candidates and that it would be unlikely. That said, the currents around here are moving so swiftly. Obviously, anything could happen. But, you know, in, in 1999, there were 13 different managers. Will she, in the end, decide to possibly lump him in? And might that be a good call? Maybe. But right now, there's much weightier questions on the Senate side. Yeah. Yeah, which is well. where I am right now, because we kind of know what's going to happen in the House, in the Senate. It's, it's not just who the managers are, but most critically, whether they're going to have witnesses and whether they're going to have a real trial. And you saw Senator Schumer today saying that he's extending this offer to Mitch McConnell. And again, my reporting is that those close to Mitch McConnell are calling it a stunt. So where does that leave us? It leaves this in the hands, potentially, of some of the most vulnerable Republicans. They only need, they meaning Democrats, two Republicans to peel off and dig their feet in the ground and say, no, we're not going to just adjourn after the attorneys make their case. We want to have witnesses. Uh, 
Um, and so right now, you know, we're trying to talk to some of those vulnerable Republicans and just not wanting to talk. Senator Ron Johnson said that's, uh, I just talked to him a few minutes ago, above my pay grade. And Lisa Murkowski kept saying, I'm hoping for a deal. I'm hoping for a deal. And then, you know, the subway elevators closed on us. Um, so we're just not getting many answers <laughs> okay. right now. You know how that works. <clears throat> well, this is fighting, is fighting to the last. Let me ask you about the first question. Yeah. Do you think there should be witnesses in the Senate? Absolutely. There Especially Bolton, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, look, I think we have a tremendous case in front of us. The president has obstructed us at every step of the way. We asked Mick Mulvaney to come and testify. He hasn't testified. We and he knows it all. He, he absolutely does. And Bolton, based on what Fiona Hill said, very, very credible. I mean, these are people that are not Democrats. These are people who were supporting President Trump. And she said this was outrageous. Um, she, these are real patriots who came forward to put country over party. And so I think that, you know, we should make sure that we have the ability to present all of these folks in the Senate. And let's just be clear that what Mitch McConnell has done, I would say, is not just a thumb. It's maybe a different finger in the <laughs> face of our Constitution and our, fa and our framers. How do you explain to, these to, people? I really don't know, Chris. I mean, how can you have, I just ask any American out there, how can you have the foreman of the jury, the chief juror, the person who makes all the rules for the Senate trial, actually say that he is coordinating completely with the defendant? That makes no sense, and I know as a former prosecutor, you know this, but I think the American people will see through this as well. This is not going to be a fair trial if that's the case. So I appreciate that Senator, uh, Senator uh, Schumer has put forward this plan. We need to make sure that there is a, a fair trial and that we have the ability for the American people, once again, to hear all the facts, including from the people who know it all. Well, one All in the loop, as, as Ambassador Sondland the said. The people that really know aren't talking. Anyway, one Democrat who's been out, except for Sondland, uh, who's been outspoken in the opposition to impeachment is expected to change parties as a result. Sources tell NBC that New Jersey Congressman Jeff Van Drew, there he is, is likely to switch his party affiliation to Republican after his own internal polling showed him he was unlikely to win re-election in the Democratic primary. Andrew was one of two Democrats to vote against the resolution formalizing the inquiry. Colin P P Peterson was the other. Yeah, I don't care. There's always going to be people like there was Gene Atkinson back in the Reagan. There's always somebody's going to flip. So what? To me, there's the trial aspect of this. Because an equivalent to me, to me, Paul, impeachment is tar and feathering. It's, it's, it's a community, it's a society saying, this guy's no damn good. And we're going to humiliate this person to an extent. Because if that's all you get, you don't get conviction and removal. That's all you end up with. Trump has this crazy ability to create craziness all around him so that we get a 50-50 vote every time we poll people. That in a polarized society, which Trump loves, you don't get justice. At least a, you don't get the perception of justice because the, it's always a 50-50 split. That's his superpower. He can he can withstand chaos. He can create chaos and chaos, withstand yeah. chaos in a way that that normal members of society can't. I think he the, wallows in it. He wallows in. He revels in it. I would actually say even more. He loves it because it's all about him. You know, it it, make, it makes him the focus of the attention. My friend George Conway says, you know, that he's got this narcissistic personality disorder. And and while I'm not a psychiatrist, that seems to be the case. What do you I, think? Look, there's personalities are great. I'm gonna go to Heidi on this as a student watching this, a reporter. Nixon didn't shake off Watergate. He knew he was guilty. He was uh, shamed by it. He said things like, that, "I gave them the sword and they stuck it in me." with relish, and I would have done the same thing to them. He knew he brought it on himself. Bill Clinton was the classic compartmentalizer. I mean, he could, he could give a speech on health care. With all this hanging on him, he could still do it. And by the way, in life, as long as there's 40 or 50 percent of the people that loved him, he hung out with the 40 or 50 percent who loved him. Trump, it scares me. I'm not sure this even is going to affect his brain, his soul, his gut. How do we know if this is even going to leave a mark on him? Heidi, tough question. Chris, Chris, on Inauguration Day, I was standing in a rain poncho on Pennsylvania Avenue listening to the speech, and it was pouring, and the president said that the sun was coming out. And I checked <laughs> around just to make sure I wasn't going crazy. And yes, it was raining. The difference with today is we have people, a number of them in the party, who are agreeing that it's raining, or agreeing that the sun is coming out. Um, you saw Debbie Lesko in the judiciary hearings afterwards, 
on network television say that the president didn't ask a foreign power to investigate his political rival when he actually did that on camera on the South Lawn, and he did it in the call summary. So the big difference today is it's not just the character of the person that we could sit here and analyze and dissect, and I am not a psychologist either, uh, but I do have eyes and ears, and I, I do see that people are telling us things that just are not true. Um, and this is the environment that we are dealing with as news reporters, that people are telling us things to our face that, that are not true. So the difference, hopefully in the Senate, will be, we, we interviewed Senator Toomey over the weekend underneath the press, and he said, look, there's, there shouldn't be much difference about the facts. The question is whether they rise to the level of impeachment, and that should be where the debate is, according to a lot of the Democrats here in the Senate who I talked to. If the Senate is supposed to be a cooling saucer, maybe that will be where things go, is that we do have a debate about the facts. What a perfect answer. Thank you so much, uh, Heidi Presblood. Boy, that was analytical, factual, objective, and a straight reporter's assessment of the truth. Anyway, thank you. Congresswoman, thank you for coming over here. Thank you, Chris. I'm Ella Jayapal. Thank you from Seattle. <laughs> that liberal bastion. Right. Yeah. That liberal bastion. Thank you, Paul Reiser. Thank Thanks. you. And that's a fact, too. <laughs> much more ahead on this historic week of reckoning for President Trump. And it will be a reckoning. And coming up, a divided country braces for a divisive impeachment trial. Hopefully it will be a real trial. Senator Lindsey Graham has admitted he will not be a fair juror and that he will acquit the president no matter what happens. But I think what's best for the country is to get get this thing over with. I am clearly made up my mind. I'm not trying to hide the fact that I have disdain for the accusations in the process, so I don't need any witnesses. <laughs> I don't need any witnesses. This is invasion of the body snatchers. Plus, Rudy Giuliani's misadventures over in Ukraine. Giuliani tells the New Yorker magazine, I believe that I needed Ambassador Yovanovitch out of the way. It sounds like a mob action or worse. And today the president again came to Rudy's defense. We've got a lot to get to this week, and we're all doing it tonight. Stick with us.